Chiming In invites you to meditate and reflect on our Good Shepherd as we play Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us.
I'm a big fan of Jim Carrey movies. Uh, he strikes my funny bone uh, with movies like Ace Ventura, Liar Liar, Dumber Dumber, uh, some of my favorites. And one that I didn't mention yet, uh, because in some strange way I think it's related to our sermon this morning, is uh, Bruce Almighty. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Bruce Almighty? Maybe half. <laughs> um, Jim Carrey plays the role of Bruce Nolan, who's a news reporter who covets the evening anchor position. And Morgan Freeman plays God. It seems to Bruce that God is not answering his prayers to be news anchor. He becomes very angry and frustrated with God when it seems his prayers aren't going to be answered. I wonder if that ever happens to us. Bruce confronts God with this, and God becomes very upset with Bruce's constant lack of faith and complaining. So God turns over his duties to Bruce. Hence the title of the movie, Bruce Almighty. Bruce is now the one answering everyone's prayers. Bruce Almighty becomes very overwhelmed very quickly with the millions of prayers it seems he's getting every hour and the complexity of answering them. So in frustration, he simply answers yes to everyone's prayers. <laughs> Sounds like a good thing, right? We get what we want. But you can imagine the chaos and pandemonium that ensues when everybody gets what they pray for. In the end, God takes back his duties and dialogues with Bruce about prayer. And a few memorable lines from the end of the movie that God directs at Bruce are, what do you really care about? Suggesting that, that, that caring about something deeply is what makes a good prayer. And a second line, since when does anyone know what they want? Thinking we know what we want and what is best for ourselves, our families, the world, is kind of putting ourselves in God's place. Less almighty, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> is the point of prayer to get what we want? If not, what is the point of prayer? I'm looking forward to Pastor Michael's sermon this morning. Let's pray. We worship you, Lord Jesus, the one who hears our prayers and knows our thoughts, even without us saying them. The one who knows what we want and what we need. The one who knows what we care about deeply. The one who answers our prayers, although we don't always sense the answer. And when we do, sometimes we don't like it. But you are God, the creator and sustainer of our life. And we trust in you, and we trust in your answers to our prayers. Increase our faith and trust in your sustaining love. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord Jesus, you are the creator and sustainer of life. Millions of people in this world pray to you for help, either for themselves or for others. We are your people. You have commanded us to care for the orphan, the widow, the destitute. Our actions can be the answer to a prayer. Someone is praying to you. Bless this offering we give this morning, and may it accomplish something that is an answer to prayer somewhere in this community or world. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 12, beginning in verse 6. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for 
Christ's sake. I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, there I am strong. moments to gather together around the scriptures. And we pray that in these moments your spirit would be our teacher. And we pray that the outcome of these moments would not be just that we gain more information about what the scripture says. But we pray that you would do in us a work of transformation so that more and more in who we are and in how we live the life of Jesus would be evident so we pray in his name. Amen. So last week I asked you who taught you to pray. And now this week I'm wondering what did they teach you? What were some of the things that you were taught about prayer as you were growing up? In Sunday school, by your parents, by your grandparents? Uh, were you taught a specific prayer to pray? Uh, what, what was that like for you? Somebody's going to be the first person to speak. The importance of doing it regularly. Yeah, the importance of regular prayer. Okay. Somebody else. Pray during each meal. Yeah, pray before every meal. Every time you sit down to eat, pray. Somebody else. It's a prayer at bedtime. Now I lay it down to sleep. And it's also in song that we would sing. Yeah, okay. So praying at bedtime. Uh, praying that prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, and then also that when we sing, we pray. When I became a Mennonite, one of the things I discovered about Mennonites is that they love to sing a table blessing. And so there were all these kind of inside Mennonite table blessings that I had to, that I had to learn when I became one of the tribe. So somebody else. Yeah, okay. So in, in Sunday school, uh, learning the Ten Commandments, learning how to turn them into a form of prayer. Somebody else? The importance of praying for others. Yeah, okay. How important it is not just to pray for ourselves, but to pray for other people as well. So last week, we talked about how when we pray, we're not giving God information. Uh, we're not compelling God's action. We're not making God do anything else that God doesn't already want to do. So what's going on when we pray? When we pray, what is happening is that God is fitting us into God's purposes for the world. God is adjusting us to what God is doing in our world. The two passages that I read this morning are passages that invite us to contemplate the, the question the issue of what happens when our prayers are not answered. What happens when we pray and we don't get what we pray for? The first example is the example of Jesus. Jesus is always our example for life. And so it is as Jesus is coming to the very end of his ministry, he goes to this place called Gethsemane. Uh, we feel like he's probably been there before. It's a common place for him to go and pray there. And so Jesus brings his disciples with him, and then he brings his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he brings them with him, and he says, look, you guys stay here and pray for me. I'm going to go a little further away and pray by myself. And when he prays, what does he pray? He says, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. And so what he's praying about is he's praying about the crucifixion that's about to happen. He's praying about this collision that he's going to have with the religious authorities in the form of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the political authorities in the form of the Romans. And he sees that collision about to happen. And yet Jesus, just like any other healthy human being, 
doesn't, in, doesn't joyfully expect to suffer. Uh, he wants to be relieved of that suffering. And so he prays to God, his Father, and he says, Look, if, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. And so Jesus is praying that somehow something would change, something would be different, and he would not have to be crucified. But Jesus also prays this. He prays, not as I will, but as you will. That's a hard prayer to pray. Because for Jesus, it meant that yes, he was going to be killed. He was going to be tortured. He was going to be crucified. For us, it can mean that in our circumstances, we are trusting God to do what we don't understand, but to work out God's will in our circumstances to bring to light what is hidden from us. Paul also prays, and in the passage that we read, Paul says, look, I, I have these surpassingly great revelations. I have these incredible, ecstatic, spiritual experiences and so to keep me from becoming conceited, what Paul's doing is he's interpreting his experience in light of God's purposes, in light of God's perspective. And he says, look, to prevent me from becoming conceited, because I had these great spiritual experiences, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan. So we don't have any idea what that was. Uh, the speculation is usually that Paul had some kind of a medical issues. Some people suggest that he had eye problems. Uh, we don't know what it was, but Paul says this thing happened to me. I had a thorn in my flesh. You might have something that feels like a thorn in your flesh. Something, it can be either a circumstance or a condition, but it's always irritating you. It's always bothering you. It's something that's chronic in your life. And you pray about it. Now, Paul's experience was that he prayed three times about this. And we know when something happens three times in the scripture that it means that uh, somebody's taking it really seriously. This is a significant thing. They're praying about it, not just in a passing way, but they're praying about it in a consistent, disciplined, focused way. And Paul prays three times for this thorn in his flesh, for this messenger of Satan to be taken away. But it's not. It's still there. But Jesus speaks to him. This is one of just a couple of times that we have the words of Jesus outside of the four Gospels. Jesus speaks to Paul, and Jesus says this to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Wow. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so this becomes, for you and for me, this becomes a key to understanding what is going on when we pray and it's not answered, what's happening when we don't get what we pray for is that it is an opportunity for God to teach us to trust God more. Now, I want to be very clear. I don't think that when bad things happen to you, that God is sending those bad things into your life for some kind of educational purpose. That's not how bad things work. Um, we live in a world that's broken. And we ourselves are broken people in need of healing. And we live in a world full of broken people and they also need healing, and they also display their brokenness in different ways. And so because of that, because our world is broken, and the people all around us are broken, and we ourselves are broken, there is going to be suffering in our world. That's just a part of life. But what we do with the suffering, what we do with what we don't understand, what we do with what we want to be gone from our lives. That is where God works in us and God works through us.
And so Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. That's an incredible promise. That means that whatever our circumstances, whatever happens to us, whatever befalls us, we know that God is going to be sufficient for us. Uh, there's a common expression where people say, well, God's never going to give you anything that you can't handle. And I, I just want to say this morning out loud, that is an untruth. That is not true. If you look at your own experience, there are lots of times, right, when God has given you more than you can handle, when God has allowed things to happen in your life that have absolutely shattered you. But, in the midst of that, God offers us God's presence in our lives. And God offers us God's grace in our lives. And we can hear the voice of of Jesus say to us, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so when we are weak, when we are shattered by our circumstances, when we don't know what to do, when we wish that things would be different, that is the opportunity for God to demonstrate God's love and God's power in our lives by the way God works in our circumstances. My grace, Jesus says, is sufficient for you. I don't have the answer to why sometimes when we pray, it feels like the answer is no, or it feels like there isn't any answer to that prayer. But I do trust Jesus. And I invite you to trust Him. I invite you this morning to hear His words to you. My grace is sufficient for you. When, when we're with Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says that in Jesus we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness because He was tempted in every way just as we are. Jesus knows what it's like. To pray a prayer and for the answer to not be what he wants. And so when we have that experience of praying and we don't seem to get the answer that we want, we can hear the words of Jesus that he speaks to us when he says, My grace is sufficient for you. Hmm. So we're going to kind of switch gears now. And we're going to talk less about what it means that we pray and the prayer is not answered or it is answered. And we're going to talk a little bit this morning about how we can pray. And I'm going to offer you just in a few minutes a quick acronym that can guide your prayer. Now some of you have probably heard this before. If you need to take a mental vacation, I will not hold that against you. Um, but the acronym is simply this. A... C, T, S, the word Acts, that first book of the New Testament after the Gospels. And Acts stands for this, it stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and this is a churchy word, but we're going to use it anyway this morning, supplication, and I'll tell you what supplication means if you don't already, but you probably do. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is adoration. That's an A in the word acts. Adoration is what we do when we thank God for who God is. Not for anything that God has done, not for anything that, uh, any way that God has acted in our lives, but we are simply thanking God for who God is, for God's character. And so we might say, God, I thank you that you are faithful like we've been talking about in that passage uh, that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, he is depending on God's faithfulness. Or we might say, God, I thank you that you love justice. We live in a world where there is so much injustice. And so we can adore God, we can give God thanks for the part of God's character that loves justice, that loves to bring about the right outcome. 
So that's adoration where we're thanking God for who God is, for God's character. C is for confession. I feel like I should have Cookie Monster up here doing this with me. Um, but C then would be for Cookie, I guess, not for confession. But in this context, C is for confession. Now, confession is simply what we do when we agree with God about where we have fallen short or we have sinned. And usually we don't need to be prompted to know what that is. But even if we do, even if we take a moment of reflection and we say, God, would you reveal to me, would you point out to me the places in my life where I'm falling short, the places where I've hurt other people, and I need your forgiveness. Or maybe it's a sin of omission where there has been something good that God promises you to do and you just let it go by. You let that opportunity pass. But confession is where we simply agree with God. We say, you're God, God, you're right. I did that. I didn't do that. That wasn't what you wanted for me. That wasn't in line with the character of Jesus. That wasn't in line with... Him living his life out through me. And so, God, I agree with you about my sin. So we confess our sin to God. We agree with God about how we fall short. So the T in Acts stands for thanksgiving. The T stands for thanksgiving. And that is where we take the opportunity just to reflect on our lives and to look at our lives and to look at everything that's good in our lives and in our world, and to thank God for that, to be specific about that. So we could say, God, I am thankful that I have something to do every day that engages my attention, that engages my time. I'm thankful that I have the opportunity for meaningful work, whatever that work might be, whether we're retired, whether we have a job that we go to every day. God, I am thankful for that work. You might say, God, I'm thankful for the people in my life who love me. I'm thankful for the people that I love, and you might call those people by name. Thanksgiving is simply when we are thanking God for specific ways that God has blessed us, for things that God has done to care for us. Now the S stands for supplication, and supplication is a weird word, right? It sounds like a word that you would only hear in church, what supplication means is simply that we are presenting our requests to God. We're asking God to intervene in our lives. We're asking God to intervene in the lives of other people. We're asking God to intervene in our world. And so we might say, uh, I might be praying for my friends Nathan and Dana, and I might say, God, would you comfort them in the loss of their son? Would you heal their hearts? I might pray for peace in our world, and so I might pray, God, I pray that there would be a ceasefire in the war in Gaza between Hamas and Israel, that the fighting would cease, that the bombing would cease, that the loss of life would come to an end. So supplication is when we make a specific request of God, when we ask God to act, to act and to move in our world. So a simple acronym to remember, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. I'm going to give you some homework this morning. I want you to go from here this morning, and I want you every day this week just to use the acronym. You don't have to spend a whole long time doing this. You can do this. All this praying can happen in about 10 minutes in your life. But I want you to carve out that time in your life this week and spend that using this acronym to engage in a time of prayer. Remember, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen.
So now we come to the part in our service when if you have a comment about the sermon, if you have a prayer concern, if you have an announcement to make, you can do that. Just raise your hand and Mark will bring the microphone to you and if you just say your name as you share. Nancy. I just wanted to highlight two of the announcements in the bulletin. Uh, this Thursday night is West Swamp Night at Rita's Water Ice in Quakertown, and uh, hopefully with the warm weather you'll be in the mood for some nice cold Rita's Water Ice. That is from 5 to 9 at the Rita's in Quakertown right on, is that Main Street or Broad Street? Or Broad Street, thank you. Um, and if you order with Uber Eats or DoorDash, you just have to designate that in your order. But otherwise, it's just anyone who shows up that night. And use the proceeds towards the playground project. And the other thing is, um, family night picnic is a week from Wednesday. Uh, that's June 19th. There's a sign-up sheet down in the fellowship room if you'd like to bring a side dish or um, a dessert. But we'll have the ice cream for sure for dessert. But uh, We'll have some games to play too and, and fellowship, fun and fellowship also on Wednesday night, that's the 19th. Thanks. Another opportunity to provide picnic things. Um, this is Rod. Uh, so the Middle Land Staff Picnic is Friday. We have a sign up sheet to uh, help out with that, with bringing side dishes and also if you want to. The uh, Alliance staff as a guinea pig for something you want to experiment on for what you want to bring to the church picnic then the next week. <laughs> a good chance. So that, that is this Friday. If you have something to bring, um, people will be, be here setting up for that uh, late Friday afternoon. And there is a sign up for that on the bulletin board also. Cindy, as she starts more therapy this week, 
God, we pray for Jeannie, that you would help her to travel safely. God, we pray for Griffin and Jane and Dia. God, we pray for our world, that violence and war would cease. And God, you know our hearts, you know the things that keep us up at night. You know the concerns that we have that we've not spoken out loud even to those who are closest to us. So we invite you, Jesus, to meet us at those points of need. God, we give you thanks that you were able to do more than we ask, even more than we can imagine through your power that's at work in us and in our world through Jesus. And so we pray in his name. Amen. reminding ourselves that there are people praying for us.